This process is called wedging. So I'm aligning the clay particles and focusing my attention and also feeling the consistency of the clay body. Getting it ready to pound it uh, and start the bottom of the vessel. And I use what's called a puki, which is a, a clay shallow dish. And the word comes, it's a Mexican word. I think that means a low flat dish. And I use that to support the bottom because the piece is, the clay is soft and so it wants to fall flat. And so in order to have a nice uplifted bottom to it, I use that for support. So I generally wedge a hundred times each piece of clay. And then I will also wedge each individual coil by hand before I apply it to the vessel. And then when I get close to 100, I'll slowly roll it in on itself until it makes like a, a shell shape. And then I usually will take it and go like that. I won't do it because the camera's there and make it into a nice lump of clay, even lump of clay. And then I take the top part of it, cut it. And this is going to be used to form the bottom of the clay. And then what I do is I compress it using the side muscle of my hand. I go about a quarter, lift it up, turn it, go another quarter, lift it and turn. And what I'm doing is I'm now compressing the clay so that it gives it some strength rather than rolling it out with a rolling pin. I will use a rolling pin but only to smooth out the hand marks once I've finished compressing it. But I don't use the rolling pin to stretch it out. I always do it by pounding it. So once I've got it close to the thickness that I want for the bottom, then I'll take it. You can see my hand marks on it. it looks a bit like a shell. I'll take the rolling pin and roll the surface. I always start very uh, methodical about how I work. So uh, I'll take it from the center, roll it forward, center, roll it back, a bit like pastry making. Turn it and forward and back. So it's smoothing out the hand marks. Turn it over, same thing. And then what I use is this low dish that I've made out of clay. It's thick, has a bevel on the edge so that when I pull this out, it doesn't run into a sharp edge. It can slide out easily. And this supports the bottom of my vessel. And I, for example, I made this piece with it. So you can see where the, the flat slab uh, was placed in here and then I started adding coils onto it in order to develop the form and to refine the form. And the reason that I do that is so that I don't um, alter the shape that I'm working on by lifting it up and turning it. So this turns much like a banding wheel, uh, but it also supports the bottom so that you get a nice uplifted quality to it. So I use a banding wheel. I don't use an electric wheel or a kick wheel. It's just a banding wheel that turns by hand. Again, uh, to help eliminate this uh, moving it and shaping it. Let it sit and then gently lift it and push it down and encourage it to go to the bottom. And then I'll trim off this excess with a fettling knife. And then just take this excess and use it for the coil that I'm going to make that goes on the inside. And then I'll start to bring it out and form it. 
But before I do that, I'll make sure that it's situated nice and evenly. You can see it's the shape of the bottom of this. And also, I will take a damp sponge and just dampen it so that the consistency of clay is similar. It keeps the right amount of moisture. It's just a little higher right here. I'll take that down here. So you can see the thickness that I'm working with. And all my pieces are uniformly the same thickness. They don't vary. I use what's rubber ribs. So they're called rubber ribs or sometimes an aluminum rib. And um, I use this to smooth out the excess clay and keep it a uniform thickness. So even if the vessel is this big, it is always the same thickness all the way through. Sometimes I may make the bottom just a little bit heavier for balance and thicker, but I'm very careful not to make it too thick because clay, clay is funny. It doesn't like, it likes evenness and when it dries evenly, there's less stress on the clay and less cracking occurs as a result of it. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to wedge the clay individually. And so I take it and I turn it and then I put it end to end and I compress it together and then I turn it and compress it and turn it and compress it. So what I'm doing again is I'm aligning the clay particles and also getting out any air bubbles that might be trapped inside. And I probably do this about 10 or 12 times and just keep massaging the clay and getting it ready to roll it out. When I was a kid in school, in the art programs, they always taught you to make a clay uh, pot. And they got us to make uh, what's called like worms, these very thin, long, kind. they were about this thick. And we would roll them out and then we would stack them on top of one another. But when I went to college, my professor there, Fred Owen, taught us to make belts of clay. And in that way, your piece has a better chance to stay more uniform because the circle, circular ones like this have got excess clay. So it's uh, easier to make an area thin, thick, thin, thick. So once I've finished wedging it, I'll take it and I roll it out. And again, it's a very methodical. I made vessels that are three feet tall by two and a half feet wide and rolled out coils that are six feet long, the length of a door. I've just taken a door down, put a piece of plywood on it and used that. And that's how big and long the clay, uh, about an inch, inch or so wide. And then I'd have to lift them up and then put them around the vessel. That's the largest that I've ever made. So rolling out the clay is really important. You, it's when you're working with clay, if you don't have patience, clay is going to teach you patience. And the thing about clay work is that you have to be very centered. And once you start working with it, the material itself centers you and it calms you. And it's especially as a hand builder, you have to just be calm, methodical, it's very slow, it's very patient work, um, and it's usually very quiet work. Sometimes I'll have the radio going or listen to music, sometimes I have the TV going, but, but generally it's quiet when I'm working. So the important thing is, is that you use even pressure back and forth and you roll the whole coil forward, roll it back, forward, back. And you keep doing it until it evens out and you get it to the length that you need. And I work with one coil that goes all the way around each time. And every time I join it, it joins on one side, then I join the next one on this side, the next one on this side, the next one on this side. So I work very evenly, even the way I attach things and very carefully. And then um, it helps to keep the balance of your work. Most, most people, when they look at my work, when it's finished, they don't even, one, they don't think it's clay. They usually think it's pewter or wood. And they also don't think it's uh, uh, hand-built. They think it's thrown because it looks so even. It's not, it has little you know, imperfections and stuff. So you see, I pounded it down the first time and it widened a little bit. You can see my hand marks. And to keep it even, I'll just hit it on its side. And you can see I'm working more with a belt of clay. 
and I'm going to turn it over and do the same thing. And if I want the clay to grow wide, I hit it straight up and down and hold my hand in front of it so it doesn't move. It gets wider instead of longer and narrower. So right away you can see how much more evenly, look at that, that you've got uh, the material that you have to work with the clay is nice and even. And the other thing about clay is it doesn't like a lot of water. So I use sponges and I just gently moisten it. I never take uh, water like a spray gun and spray what I'm working on. I'll spray my bulk clay piece here, but I won't spray this or any of the work that I'm working on because the spray is too uneven and it can weaken it. So I only use sponges to keep it moist. And I always take off the ends because if there's ever going to be um, air trapped in it, it would be in the end area. And you can see it's thinner usually in the end. So I take that off, put it back in the pile, and then I'm going to attach it to the inner slab, inner part of the slab. And I overlap it about a quarter of an inch. And I just put it in place first. I'm not attaching it, I'm just placing it so that I have room to move it if it's uneven. And when I get to the end, I just hold it and pull it up and forward to me in order to break it off. And then I pinch it together. And then I'll check it to make sure that it's even, look at it, or relatively even. And then I always do the ends first and compress it from the inside into the bottom slab. And then slowly go around and attach it. And then once I've done that, I'll lift it and slide it on its side and make sure that this is nice and compressed. And then what I do is I go down below it and I roll it up in order to get any air bubbles that might be trapped in there and I can press it. And generally where one hand is working, the other hand is supporting on the inside. And I use a lot of pressure, like I'm not just doing this, right? So you can see each one of my steps is um, done all the way around and then I go back. So now I'm just taking and compressing it in there before I even start to smooth it off and start to develop a shape. I want a good, uh, a good strong vessel so you have to work, you know, each individual step is done equally all the way around. And then I'll start to smooth it. So I start way back here to compress it and push the clay and go around and do the same thing here. Your hands and your arms, your whole body actually, it's really an aerobic exercise. When I work, I work for 12 hours a day, for sure, if I'm working for a show or if I'm working on a series of vessels. I usually will work on two at a time if I'm working on big vessels because when one is setting up, I can work on the other one. Um, and they kind of come out like male and female, oddly enough. The forms does, it's odd. And they're kind of like um, siblings in a way. So I'll go around it again and just slowly bring it around. And this hand is feeling the thickness and it's measuring the amount of pressure that I need to apply in order to keep it even. Once I've gone all the way around, I'll go to the inside and start uh, compressing it and joining it. And right away I can feel my hands, they're sore, right? Because I'm using a lot of focused uh, energy on using them. So now again, I'm gonna go into here. You can see the outside, how it is. And now I'm gonna join the inside by doing the same thing. I start from way up here and come down. So nothing is random in hand building. It's all very measured and very focused. It's not just randomly like, oh, you know, whatever, right? You have to be very um, deliberate about every step that you do. And I always stand. The only time I sit is when I burnish or polish the surface with a, suit, a smooth stone. So that was way quicker to get to that. 
And once I've got that done, then I'll take it and I'll take the rubber rib. And each one of these ribs are different colors because they denote the different stiffness of each one. So here's the greens, kind of stiff. The red's the softest, the most flexible. The, the purple blue one is really stiff. And then of course the metal one is sharp and you have to be careful with it because you can slip and cut into it. Uh, I generally start with the aluminum rib and use these for smoothing the surface. So now what I want to do is take the excess amount off. So now I'm going to continue smoothing. I'm going to use the aluminum rib and the aluminum rib is fairly flexible. And I'm going to start by going below and gently coming up. I never do everything in one swoop. You know, I wouldn't go all the way. I always lead into it. And see how the top of my hand, this hand is holding this down and keeping it. These three fingers are inside, making sure that it's not flexing too much. And the aluminum rib on the outside is doing the, the scraping of the excess amount, scraping it off. Then I slowly work my way up. So right now I'm not really, uh, you know, working with form per se. What I'm doing is making sure that I have a really strong base shaped vessel that I can develop the form as I go. But I always make sure that it's a, a really well made uh, vessel. So if I want the piece to start growing out and have a nice big round belly to it, I call it, uh, I'll start adding the coils on the outside. If I want it to come in right away, I add it on the inside and then I'll start directing it to come in. And my coils are usually indicating a couple of coils away where I'm going. In my mind, I know, you know, I'm going to build it out so I know it'll probably come out after a while you get well, two coils will get me out to here, roughly. So I, I generally know how big the piece is going to be. Um, but I don't always know what's going to come out either. It's actually rare that I know. I might start and go, I want to make a pod, or I want to make a petal, or I want to make a petal unfurling, or I want to make an ola. But I never, I never let that stop me from allowing the clay to also be a part of it and decide what it wants to become because I'm just, I'm just the maker. It's like a relationship, right? There's always uh, a give and take in any relationship and clay is like that. It has its own personality. Some is very short and doesn't have a lot of flexibility. Others are really wobbly and loose because it has grog in it or little bits of other dry clay bits. So it has a personality and you have to work with and honor the integrity of that. Of the, of the earth because we're working with the earth all this clay is uh, it's called a blended clay body which means it's natural occurring clay from a great glacier in Alberta it's on the border between Alberta and Saskatchewan and it's mined and then they blend different um, kinds of clay together to get different temperature ranges so it's not chemically combined clay. Chemically combined clay is where I would go and I get a Kentucky ball clay from Kentucky. I get uh, all my, my whiting from Europe or, you know, so all the chemicals and components it takes to make clay, I would get in a dry form, put it together and then blend it uh, with water. And so it has no age to it. It's brand new and it's very um, different to work with. I don't think, I've never worked with uh, a, a clay body. I always use uh, glacier clay from Alberta. Or I might go out and dig clay myself uh, to use. But uh, the forms that I make are really require a lot of strength and durability for the ways, uh, for what I do in order to get that shape, right? So I couldn't, I don't think I could get that with a, with a brand new clay body, it needs to have this uh, plasticity, certain kind of plasticity to it. And 
Yeah, I could manufacture it by putting vinegar in it. That helps. There are little tricks that you can do, right, to help speed up that process. But I prefer just to get uh, naturally dug clay, natural occurring clay. So now I've got the soft rib, and I'm just going to go and I'm going to smooth it gently. So I'm breathing life into something, right? I'm. That's why it's important to have... You know, we say here you need to have a good heart and a good mind when you're doing things. And generally, I have nothing in my mind. That's a great thing about working with your hands is it stops your internal dialogue. And so it's calming. It's very calming and it's very methodical. And it's just good. It's good for your, your energy to, uh, to do that. Uh, give your brain a break from overthinking everything. Tactile things usually do that for you. So once I've smoothed it off to my satisfaction, I'm going to go back and continue to smooth as I go. I'll go back and forth to keep it uniform. Uh, I'm going to roll out another coil and then add it uh, to the outside. But I would only be able to get away with one more because it'll be too wet and it'll want to fall out this way. So what I do is I take t-shirt material and I wet it, I rip it into strips, and then I uh, wet it and put it over top of the edge and keep that moist while the bottom area uh, gets dry and supports itself. And then I'll, I might have to even cover it overnight with a piece of plastic, depending on how wet the clay is. Then I'll go back to it and add more, it, but it has to be able to support itself. And sometimes when I'm making vessels that are coming really out like this, and it's a very, slow long kind of form that I'm making I have it might take me three or four days just to get it out that far because it has to set up through each each step that I'm going through it can't take the weight of it so again it's very slow hand building's not for everybody it takes it takes a lot of um, just patience but like I say if you don't have patience you'll soon have patience <laughs> it teaches you patience so again, I'm always keeping the surface nice and moist here because I know it's, uh, that clay is fairly moist. Enough. And sometimes, you know, you can also just lightly dampen it just to keep it from drying out. But my studio, I work in the basement of my home and the studio is uh, a lot uh, cooler than the upstairs. It's always warmer upstairs. So I would never have a studio upstairs in any place. I like it in the ba in a basement, especially for hand building, because you need your work to dry really slowly. If it dries too fast, it'll crack. So I just leave it and then I step aside and I'll roll out another coil. It's very, very rhythmical. I always tell students when I'm teaching, there's three things about hand building, rhythm, support, and pressure. So rhythm is this, sound. You need to listen, it's a very, it's a whole bodily experience. It's not just, you need to not ignore that. You have to remember it. So you know, even rhythm, support, where one hand is working, the other is on the other side supporting it. And pressure, so it's not light, uh, heavy, light, heavy, light, heavy, light. It's even pressure that you're applying. And that's reflected in the rhythm, the sound that it makes. And I really, really like that about hand building is that it's rhythmical. There's, you know, it includes all your senses. It's not just, um, it slows it down so much. When you're on the wheel, it's like the wheel is always shaking and it's always demanding more and more and more. But hand building, it just takes it the opposite direction and it's very rhythmical peaceful, very calming, and it's almost like it sets your heart. You know, when you're doing aerobic exercise, you can feel your heart speed up. But when you're hand building, because it's so rhythmical, it calms your heart. And it just keeps you in the state of just a, a very pleasant state of being. And so I think that's what I really enjoy about it, is that it gives you solitude and reflective time. Right? without really coming to any conclusion. It's just a very calming experience. It's always, the other thing too about clay making is you have to know when to stop. Or it's any creative process. That's the big trick, isn't it? Knowing when to stop. It's not about what you do, it's about knowing when to stop. 
And also in hand building, you have to stand back and you have to look at what you're doing and take that time to acknowledge what's before you before you go on to the next step so you can see where you're going. It's You just don't randomly go in there and go, yeah, I'm just going to do that, right? I'm uh, really super thoughtful about what, what's going on here. And when I'm working, I always work away from me so I can actually see what I'm doing. And you can see how I hold the clay with this hand up here and gently set it in place. Oh, I was going to put it on the outside. You do have an option, you can put it on the inside and then just bring it out by using the ribs. But if I really want to come out in a nice, out on this angle, then you have to start by putting it on the inside. Overlap the end, pinch it together, and then just go around it and just check and make sure that it's evenly placed before you start pinching it together or anything. Set it, make sure it's setting in the pookie. Good, stand back, take a look. It's pretty good, it's you know it's a little bit low in here, but that's okay, we can deal with that later. And then I'm gonna just stand back and I'm gonna pinch it together gently by taking my thumb on the outside and kind of rolling down a little bit to make sure that there's no air getting trapped in it, just gentle. Nothing is abrupt in hand building. It's always these series of little steps lead to a finished product. And then I'll make sure it's all evenly, you know, uh, compressed. And then I'll slide it out again so I can see what I'm doing. Work from the side. My eye is straight down the side so I can see what I'm doing. One hand is supporting, the other one is going to join it. So I'll take either my thumb or this. Sometimes I'll roll it first. Other times I'll just go in there and just take it with my thumb up and down. And again, it's gentle. I don't do the whole thing the first time round. I just don't get in there and do it. That's how you make a really uneven work, by doing abrupt things. Generally, if I'm working for a show, it takes me a year or two to get say if I'm going to show say 10 pieces then I make 20 pieces and then I choose the show and so it might take me two years to do that to get what it is that I'm that I'm trying to convey in a group and so I get up every morning at the same time I go swimming to keep my upper body uh, in good shape because this requires a great amount of like the wedging the coiling the standing your back you really have to keep yourself physically um, able to do the work. It's very, very physically demanding. And uh, the older that you get, the more you have to be very aware of that because it can be, it can really wreck your back if you don't take care of it. Because look at the odd angle I have to be on in order to get in there and see what I'm doing. And just standing for 12 hours, I don't, it's hard to just stand for 12 hours. So then I would go, I support on the outside, same thing, gently smooth it. And in and out. All the way around. So that's all I would be able to do on this one for a number of hours because it's I could add one more but what will start happening is the weight of it and the moisture will start it to want to kind of fall out in a certain way and I don't want that to happen it's just nice the way it is it's got a nice shape that's starting to happen so for the sake of um, it to be on the safe side, I'll err on the side of safety and I'll just stop here. I'll cover the edge of it. And then I'll, I'll show you another way that I, that I work is by pinch pot. 
So um, everybody's taught how to make pinch pots when they're kids. Uh, but first I'll smooth all this off and then I'll cover it and then I'll make a pinch pot for you so you can see how, that's a way to start another bottom. And you can make a huge vessel with a pinch pot. Um, you just have to work very slowly and carefully. So I'll go around one more time and just take that excess clay and distribute it. Hand building is very economical too. You see, there's not a lot of waste that goes on here. Everything that I'm not using goes back in here and then I'll give it a little spray, keep it the same moisture, wedge it up and use it. This, this clay is a little bit, um, it's got a lot of sand in it. And because it's sandy, what I do is I take another clay body that is like orange, got a lot of ochre in it or iron and I slake it down or put a lot of water in it to make it liquid, like evaporated milk. And uh, I sieve the sand out of it and I just use the color of the clay. And I apply it and then I burnish that into the clay to give it a smooth surface because sometimes when it's a bit too groggy, the little particles will come out and scratch it as you're going when you're trying to compress it and that's not fun to do. So with the addition of the slip on it, it, it changes the color, but it also will um, give it a smoother surface to burnish. So, you know, if you don't have a clay body that's really as smooth as you would like it to be for burnishing, you, you can always do that. You can make a, another clay body, slake it down, and, or use another clay body, slake it down and apply it. You have to let it dry a bit before you burnish it. You see I'm taking, how much I'm taking off? Not a lot, just enough to keep it. Just gently put it back in and then take the excess on the inside. Again, starting way below from where I was working, or just below, and taking it up and off. Again, you can see. And I, I've checked this, and I can tell a lot by how evenly I'm working or not. So I take a quick glance and I can see how even I'm taking my work off. So this is a good way to see how you're working if you want to check. If you're using uh, you know, equal, uh, equal amount of pressure, and then I'll take a softer rib and tidy it up before I cover it up. I always kind of work finished as I go as well. So I always remind students that don't leave a bunch of cruddy stuff down here because by the time you get up here, it's harder to get down there to clean it up and you're gonna affect the shape or you could potentially affect the shape of uh, that you're trying to acquire. So always work finished as you go. Don't just take for granted, oh, I can go back there and clean it up. Don't be lazy about it. Like clean it up now and then you don't have to think about it and go back to it. So I, before I stop, I'll make sure it's to the smoothness and um, evenness that I want it before I, I set it aside to let it dry a bit. Again, I'll, I'll have to just slide it out a bit just to get down here to get this nice and even. Clay likes a really direct, firm action. It doesn't like wishy-washy, <laughs> right? So you have to be very, uh, very direct with it. It's sort of like a child. I, I have to laugh at parents nowadays because everybody wants to talk their kid out of it. And they give them this huge, like, you know, PhD dissertation on why they shouldn't be doing something. And really all you have to do is pick the kid up and set him down, like if you want him to do something, right? And we spend all this time talking about it. And clay's kind of like that. It likes this direct action. It likes to know the direction it's going in. It likes it to be done fairly quickly, but accurately. And I think that's what kids require. They like good guidelines. They don't like to be told what to do, but they like to know the parameters with which they're living in. And when you do that, you set that up, they just fall into it. You never have to tell them again, usually, if you just say, right? This is how it is, this is how, and you stick with it. If it's bedtime or whatever, you, what's going on 
and they get into it and they like it. They thrive when it's like that. And clay is the same, the same way. Once it knows what you want from it, everything's okay. You'll get there. But if you don't have a direct, you know, in your mind, it doesn't have to be fully formed. But if if you don't, if your hands aren't being very firmly directing it, then that's what your piece looks like. That's what you end up getting, a vessel that looks like, oh, well, it's kind of wishy-washy, right? But if you're very firm and direct and say, nope, this is how I want it, then it's, it's good. And it's not about being, um, it's a discipline, but not the kind of discipline that you think of when you use that word discipline. All it means is that you're very focused, that you have a strong, direct intent about it. And quite often, I'm working from here from my core energy. This is where all my strength, all my energy comes from, is right here. So your core energy is what carries you through life. So if you're ever feeling like, oh, I'm just so tired all the time, I can't, you know, I've got no, my, you just feel like you're sagging your spine, then you need to work on your core energy. Wedging is wonderful, wedging clay is wonderful for that, because that's what you're doing. You have to just tighten all these muscles and get it all together and it gets nice and tight and firm. That helps support your back and uh, allows you to work, you know, in this way for a little bit longer and more. You have more strength when you're doing it. So that core energy is applies to everything. You know, if you've got a really good solid core energy, you're a happier camper, I think. But you have to do things to ensure that. So that's pretty much it for now. So it looks good enough. You can see the inside. Pretty smooth, the outside, pretty smooth even. And it's still gonna have a little bit of play to it, so I can still bring it out a little bit. I'll have room to move. But it's the it's the basic start of it. So I always like to say that, uh, like with throwers, they always throw a cylinder and then they make their vase shape or their bowl shape, or they, it usually is the cylinder is the go-to beginning shape. And in my case, hand building, my the olas that I make are the go-to basic shape so even if I'm going to make a pod or a petal like this uh, this is a, a pod and so you can see it's got all this stuff protruding out of it but I started by making a, a ola shape right then what I did was I uh, trimmed it here to know where I wanted to, to go. Well, first of all, this inner part was done first. So uh, what I did was I started to develop what's called the application of vertical coils. And nobody had ever done that before, certainly in the realm that I was working. And by Fred teaching me how to use these bands of clay, I was able to take these bands of clay and then use them. So what I would do is bring this out, motion it, and it would have like a little ridge that came out. And then I started applying vertical coils this way. And that had never been done before. That's how I can get these shapes. And then what I do is I go inside and I pull them out, take it off, pull them out, wet it down with a sponge, pull them out and do that. So, but with every action, I will go this one, this one, this one, this one. So I work very evenly around. I never work on one and finish it. I do the same repetitive motion all the way around. So then what I've done is I've taken and added coils that are standing this way onto it in order to get this outer pro protrusion, right? So it becomes very much about geometry and space. Remember I was talking to you about positive and negative space. So now we're, t we're not just looking at form, external form, we're looking at the positive or the uh, negative space that the vessel is holding inside. And that becomes an integral part to the form itself. And it's really an important thing to think about. I mean, because look at the amount of action. This is very dynamic. It's not, you know, it's, I've had people look at my work and go, I really, I want to put my hand in there, but I feel like if I do, it's going to snap my hand off, right? And so it's got tension, but it's attractive and it kind of, you just want to feel it. And so it creates a, a dynamic that to me is unexpected in clay. Because we're used to clay as being a utilitarian, you know, a cup, a bowl, a plate, right? It's not, uh, it's used for sculpture, but it's usually sculpturing uh, or sculpting, uh, 
bodies, like male and female bodies. So I think that's one of the reasons my, my work is um, considered unique, is that it's, it, it's sort of between those both states. So I call them sculptures. I call them, you know, um, they're not, they're, it's not craft, it's not, uh, it's not art in a way, it's just what it is. It's a reflection of nature. Uh, but it's very dynamic compared to most objects that are made with, uh, with clay. And then what I'm going to do is take my clay here. Just make sure there's no little cutting pieces. Oops. And I'm going to take that uh, excess clay that I had from my other coil. And I'm going to wedge it again. I always wedge my clay. And this is the great time. I stand, I walk around, I look outside. I, you know, I just kind of think about nothing. Something might come into my head and then it kind of disappears. And, but it's a very kind of deep reflective time. And uh, I, I like it because, and then I'll stand back and look at my work and where I am and think, oh, well, maybe I could go out there or I could do that with it. And then when I just start working and whatever, is going to happen comes out. It's very, very, um, I don't have intent. I, I kind of believe that, no, I don't kind of, I do believe that if you have a really rigid idea, like this is how it needs to be, you're going to be disappointed because we always don't usually get it how we want it to be. We have to negotiate it and be satisfied and compromise. So I've learned not to have uh, expectation because if you have expectation, you're always disappointed because it never turns out the way you want it. There's always some kind of difference that occurs. So if you're too rigid about the material that you're working with and you're too demanding with that material, you're kind of not allowing it to have its say, you know, and, and you're not honoring it its own material integrity. So that's why I don't ever have a, you know, I sketch, but I sketch so that I can see things. I don't sketch to make that object. I may make something that's similar or reflective or kind of echoes it a bit, but I never draw it and say, that's how it needs to be. Because even the firing method using sawdust, I never know what's gonna end up on the surface of it. There is absolutely no control. Once I give it to the sawdust and the elements, the rain, the wind, whatever is going to happen, the snow sometimes, I, it, it's, I have no control and that's why I do this because I don't want to control it. I don't want to control the world. I want to become a part of the world and live with its nature and understand uh, how important that is and to honor its own thing. Humans always want to control everything. It, cra it just cracks me up that people think that we we do contribute to climate change, but this is evolution, right? And yes, we have to be responsible human beings. We have to take care of our waste and waste management. We need to understand fossil fuel and what it's doing to our air and things like that. But we also have to understand that we live in a universe that is vast and huge and dynamic and quite frankly humans aren't at the top of the heap when you look at that and so when i hear people say you know we're responsible for climate change it's like hello can you control the wind can you control the thunder and lightning can you control earthquakes can no so in a way i almost feel like yes we're making an impact but one of the things we're neglecting is to actually honor the earth, to honor it, and to look at it not by controlling it and making people control it, but to honor it and live in a way with it that honors its integrity. That's very different than wanting to control it or say that I could control it, right? So I always laugh because I think of it in a slightly different light. I don't think of it that way. And I've seen things happen that prove that to me, right? That there is magic that happens. And we always don't have to have the answer. And believe me, 
If Mother Earth wants to take care of it, she will. She cracks the whip, boy. I don't know if you've been in a hurricane or an earthquake, but oh, when you're in those things, I've been in both, it's like, wow, I really am just nothing in the face of the universe. So you're at the mercy of that. Teaches you a really good perspective. So yeah, I'm not about controlling stuff because that just leads to kind of divisiveness and with divisiveness can come negativity and with negativity comes discomfort and then it just goes into this really kind of vicious cycle. Um, I'm more about, you know, I really admire Zen Buddhism and how they just kind of bow to that, right, and understand and try and live in harmony with it, with everything that they do and be just thoughtful and caring rather than greedy and wanting, you know. And control is all about want. So it's, um, our, our attitudes as humans need to evolve, right? I think more spiritually and understand, uh, I often think what it would be like to have been earth worshippers, you know, like 500 years ago, the Druids and that, and how they, I think that was the last known people that I know of in that way that were considered that that they were really honoring the earth and respecting the earth and that, that that they didn't understand, they respected it. They didn't necessarily have to understand it, they just needed to respect it. And I think that we're missing that a lot of the time. So now what I'm doing is I'm making a ball. And so I started with just a clay uh, and then I slowly started to put it in on itself, put it in on itself, and then I started to hit it with the butt of my hand, and now I have a ball. And so the thing about pinching pots is that you have to recognize the weight of it. The more condensed that it gets, the heavier it seems to feel. And you can almost feel the inner workings of it, the evenness of it. And it gets to a certain weight, you go, ah, it's ready to put a hole into it and to start pinching it out. It seems even, it seems dense and then I will look at it, make sure there's no cracking, and if there is, I'll make sure that, like here's a little slight crack, I'll smooth it. Maybe give it a little extra moisture before I actually start to pinch it so it has room to move without cracking. It, inevitably it will, because it's the nature of this particular clay body, it's really gritty, so it's probably gonna crack. But So I round it off like a snowball, and notice I never ever start with anything bigger than what I can't cover my both hands with ever. It's always the same size. So whether I'm going to make a vessel that's this big or a vessel that's just that big, I always start with the same ball of clay. And that's how I judge it. It has to be able to hide in my hand, right, like that. And so I hold it very firmly. I'm mostly right-handed, although I'm ambidextrous, but I use my right hand more than my left. And I hold it and then I put, if you look at your thumb, you have a flat area on your thumb, but you have a kind of slightly rounded. So you have to take that in consideration. So I'll start by just uh, poking a hole, turning it, poking a hole, because I want a, a nice round cylinder. I don't want to just go in there. Most people will just go in there and start pinching, but I don't. I go in there and I create a cylinder. And then I slowly drill my way down and turn it as I go. So now you're, you're starting with even walls, right? And I'll go, I leave the bottom a little bit thicker because I, I don't want to poke all the way through and you don't want a thin bottom because it'll crack usually. The weight of the vessel that you're making will cause it to crack. I've had that where I've made this big beautiful vessel and I've looked at the bottom and it has a huge crack on the bottom of it because I wasn't paying attention to the thickness. And then I will just shape it while it's upside down like we were talking about Gaudi, <laughs> working upside down. And then, uh, you see, it's like Tom Thumb. I've got a palm on my thumb. And then I'll start to pinch. And pinching is funny. It's not, pinching isn't what you think it is. Uh, when I say pinching, you think of this. You know how somebody will pinch you, right? Like this. But when, in pottery making, pinching isn't that. What pinching is, is one hand stays like still, and this hand goes to it. So it's not doing this. It's doing this, right? It's very subtle, but it's something important to remember when you're working. 
And again, it's the same thing. You can use one or two fingers, whatever you're comfortable with. And just go around it. And then you slowly start to spiral up. And again, this is a very meditative, meditative process to do this. I'm so, I'm so thankful I don't have arthritis or anything in my hands. That would be so horrible to get arthritis, not to be able to work with clay or have the strength. So you see how I'm slowly winding my way up to the top and you can see how it's starting to open up and of course the top's going to crack up here so just moisten it. We're going to fill that with the a coil but I will moisten it just so that it doesn't and sometimes I'll go back and smooth it together so it doesn't get too big of a crack. Pinch it, smooth it and then go back to pinching. And you know a little pinch pot like this I could probably work on it for an hour easily. So it's again it's a slow process. As soon as I get the thickness that I want, I'll start adding coils to it. I'll set it on my banding wheel and then I'll set it down, flatten it so it has a nice bottom. And then I'll go and start working with the ribs again and evening it out before I add on more, uh, more coils. And again, you can just build huge vessels that way, right? It doesn't, uh, doesn't require a pookie, but pookie makes it easier to start with when you're first learning. So I always get people to make their, their own pookies to, to work with. Have you ever worked with clay? No. In, ch in school? Yeah, I used to uh, a little bit, yeah. yeah. Kids are funny sometimes. Kids go, oh, I don't want to touch that stuff. It's gecky. Because, you know, kids are taught, you mustn't get dirty. Right? You must, yeah. And if you do get dirty, you have to wash your hands right away. So I think kids are sort of like, that's in their head. And so this feels like, but my hands are fairly clean, right? As they're not totally gecky. But <laughs> the kids are funny. Some of them don't like the feel of it. And others just totally get into it. So the other thing you can do, and now that I've got it open a bit, I'll go in there with these two fingers and just slowly start to compress it and bring it out and start to shape it as well. And then I'll go back and pinch the walls a bit more to thin it out. But you can start shaping it at this point, directing the clay to come out a bit more. And again, keep this moist, the, the rim of it. You see it wants to crack there, which is normal. And then, then I'll go and just smooth it. Don't crack too much. Then go back to pinching. And then again, you need to stop and kind of okay, okay, where am I? Right? Let it drop by its own weight and stand back and take a look at it. You know, I'm not really too fussy at the beginning of it. It's like it's off a little bit here, off a little bit there. My priority is the thinness and the evenness of the wall. So again, clay likes to be even. It can be evenly thick or it can be evenly thin, but it doesn't like to be thick, thin, thick, thin. Because when it dries, it creates stress. Because a thicker one takes longer to dry, a thicker area, a thinner one fast. And so that's what creates the stress and that's what can create the cracking. The other common thing that happens is people overwater their work and then it pools in the bottom and they don't see it and it absorbs in there before they can see the droplets. And then after a while, a big, huge crack will start to form because it's gotten too moist. And so there's, you could patch it, but it's always going to be a weak spot. I'll gen generally just start over. I'll go, oh gee, right. I uh, wasn't paying close enough attention. So, and on the outside, when it starts to crack a little bit, stretch, stretch marks, you can go in there and you can just gently close them off 
and then add a little bit of moisture with your sponge because they too will get very very dewy sometimes i like that and i leave them in there and i purposely make big deep stretch mark stretch stretch surface because it creates a nice texture and then go back to pinching for pinching pots i'll sit down when i'm doing this and I do raku as well. So when I'm making tea bowls like this, this is a tea bowl, uh, and uh, which is a raku where you use glaze. Burnishing, hand building, uh, and burnishing you don't use a glaze. But with raku, you have low fire glazes. And they're put into reduction bins or reduction chambers to create flashing and create carbon on the surface. Um, so these are all pinch pots as well. This is a winter tea bowl. It's thicker, more voluptuous. Uh, uh, summer tea bowl is usually a bit thinner, a bit more um, elegant. I mean, these can be elegant, but you can see they're much more sturdier. And I'm a wood fire. I'm not a propane fire. I always use uh, maple wood or oak. I would never use a cedar or fir because it burns too quickly and not hot enough. And the real trick about burning with wood is that you, in a sawdust or in a raku situation, is it's the embers, the accumulation of embers in the firebox that creates the heat. So when you're working at optimum uh, pace, you, the small piece of wood that you throw in there combusts immediately, and then it turns to uh, to ash uh, and then it settles and so the firebox itself is usually about two and a half feet in height and the entire thing by the end of the evening is filled it'll eventually all burn away but it's that's where you get your main heat from and you just uh, add one or two sticks and it combusts immediately to keep the temperature even and it's very low fire temperature range so it doesn't take much to flux the glazes but um, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the ember bed where you get all your heat from. And of course, the kind of wood that you use, you want uh, a medium to uh, hot firing wood like oak. Oak is okay. You can use fir, but it's just going to take more. We use sometimes just wood ends and stuff from plywood, not plywood, but two by fours and things, which is usually fir, Douglas fir. You can use it, but it just takes a little bit longer. Good one is, um, I like using maple wood because it's a hard wood. And I also like using oak if you can get it. The other thing about this method of working, I specialize in hand building and primitive firing techniques. And the primitive comes from not the form, but it comes from the firing method. So they're the kind of thing where you would dig a big pit on a beach and you throw all of you know, sticks, create a fire, let it burn down to embers, and then slowly have vessels uh, warming up, right? And getting closer and closer, and you eventually cover it and uh, put some more wood on it, but maybe some combustible material or sawdust and stuff to create a reduction atmosphere where there's no oxygen in it. And then you'd fire them and then let it cool. Or raku, the same thing. It's a low fire technique. You use wood. A lot of people use propane. Uh, I always use wood. I'm more traditional in that way. And then, and uh, even with the sawdust firing, I use sawdust to create the surface patterning. And so again, I just go and gather all that stuff. I don't. It's uh, really good because it's like. Uh, you don't have to buy it, you just go to carpentry shops, make sure there's no uh, kind of chemicals or particle board in it, um, and ask them for just their sawdust, which is, they just give it to you in bag loads, right, giant bag loads. To fill my kiln, my sawdust fire kiln, I probably need about three large garbage bags full of sawdust. And when you open up the kiln, there's nothing left, it's totally burnt away. Create smoke, neighbors don't appreciate the smoke, luckily I'm my neighbors are a little bit away from me. But. So you can see how it's starting to take shape. So again, I you know I don't overwork my stuff. What I do is I go, I'll set this one aside too, and I'll go, okay, that's good enough for now. And then I'll put the t-shirt material on it, let it sit up for a minute, 
and uh, maybe start another one or just take a bit of a break, right? And then just keep working that way. And before you know it, 12 hours has gone by. <laughs> Get up and do it again. And then if they're going to sit overnight, you just put a piece that you put them in a plastic bag. But always make sure that the, that it's not going to. You don't want that plastic bag to stick to it. So what you do is you put it, you put it in there. And then you create like a bubble, like that. You see. People, you, you know, uh, if you've got a big studio, or there's a lot of people, you have a damp room, so you keep it at a certain dampness, right? You can put in a dehumidifier or, what, or a humidifier and keep it damp that way. Um, but you can do with hand building just that simple, just keep it. If this sticks to it, what it'll do is it'll make it sweat, and then droplets of water go in there and it can weaken it. So that's why I like to keep like a bubble of air around it. Sometimes I can't, I can't do that, so if I have um, like thinner plastic, like a uh, dry cleaning bag, then I'll go and I'll turn it over so that it doesn't beat up uh, because I don't want it to get soaking wet again because it will, it'll, the, it starts to want to evaporate, right? I always say this is sa hahatamoch. It's our sacred earth. The earth is sacred. It's not, it's not just dirt it's it has its own nature it has its own personality it's sacred and we, we look to a god as being sacred that we can't even see that it's based on faith yet the earth is truly the most sacred thing and we see it all the time we feel it the wind we see the stars we you know we hear its sounds we hear the birds that live with the nature we hear all those things but we just take it for granted and we don't say enough that that is where the sacred lies is in the earth it feeds us it clothes us it comforts us it houses us it gives us everything and if we didn't you know work with it um, you know to take all that benefit from it uh, we would have nothing right we wouldn't last very long if we didn't understand. So I think our attitude as humans, it has to change. It has to become more humble. It has to go uh, about thinking about the earth first and realizing that without all of that, we will become nothing. And so we, you know, we only want to faster, bigger, stronger. <laughs> Right? This is sort of all of our goals. But we never go slower, thoughtful. Everybody's racing to be the best. I don't know what they're racing for, but it's always competitive. It's the goals are really in a way unrealistic, right? And it, it's all based on appetite. But I think if we slow down our greed, our want uh, to always be satiated and you know at any expense, I think that the world might uh, t you know take us uh, in a better way right and we might get along a little bit better and we shouldn't have to place our faith in things we cannot see that are like gods and things like that to be good we should be able to do that just because we're thankful to have the earth feed us and look after us and house us and clothe us and things like that so i i think that's the i think that's the biggest thing i've the other thing that happens when you're working with clay and the way I work with stuff pops into your mind like I have written on my wall thinking is not the answer to your question uh, the age of reason was a misconception is one of my things right but I write on my walls all the time and I, I really like that and so uh, it's important and then I'll, I'll erase it all I've had enough of that or not too long ago I had there I'm working on a series of watercolors so I did a bunch of just um, random pastel stuff with color and just to loosen up. And then after I took it all down, I wrote, uh, celebrate your vibration, right? Because it's about the vibration that you have, your shuli, we call it, your spirit that's in your body. 
and, and celebrate that by any way that you can. And uh, this one here, I came to that, I was just making pottery. And I was trying to think of a name of a person that our family traveled with, and they were called the Goodfellows. And so uh, his name was Babe Goodfellow. And do you think I could think of his wife's name? I couldn't. And I, I'm the kind of person where I'll just let it go. About it'll pop into my brain at some point. Don't obsess over it. But I also believe that the answer will come to you if you put it out there. So I went to visit my friend, Shirley Thompson, and I said to Shirley, uh, you know, how you doing? And everything. Oh, she said, I'm kind of forlorn. You know, my puppies have, uh, my old puppies have gone one after the other. And, and Millie was the last one to go. And I went, that's her name. It was Millie. And I, so I said, thank you so much, because that's the answer I've been looking for. So that's what I mean about that thinking is not the answer to your question. That once you ask the question, the universe will give you the answer. It, it offers it to you somehow and it presents itself. And so that's not about you going two and two is four and if I do this, I can get that. It's about sitting in one place and asking the question or moving about and then it presents itself like that. So that's a very different way of living and understanding your place in the universe, right? It's not coming at it from a controlling way and that if I can't come up with the answer, there's something wrong with me. It comes and then it's a fun thing. It's like, oh, there it is, right? And it's a way, uh, it's sort of like an exercise in letting go, right? And always trying to be in control. Because being in control is what has got us into this predicament that we're in. Everybody wants control, right? And so it's not healthy. It's very divisive. So I think it's more about learning to let go, more about appreciating what you have, and not really always aspiring to more, 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 but simply being satisfied with what you have. And realizing that we all have great gifts to offer and that we want to nurture those gifts in what within one another that's huge and i say that i think because i'm a teacher and i've learned that but even the way we rear children you know children are the same we bring children into the world but we indoctrinate them into the capitalistic world certainly in the west and it's sort of like you are going to be taught to grow up get a job make money and contribute to economy that's what you are, you're a soldier to the economy. But from an indigenous perspective, my elders have taught me that children come to this side of the world um, with gifts that have been given to them by the ancestors that have already crossed over. And it's up to uh, the elders and older people, their parents, to nurture those gifts, to watch for those gifts, to nurture them so that they become their their you know, most sentient being. And that then they become uh, contributors to a different kind of consciousness. It's not about becoming slave to capitalism or democracy or political entities. It's about understanding who you are and what you have to offer. And our schools, in a way, strip the children from that because they don't allow them, they do maybe in an art class, but even then, you know, it's like, here's a piece of paper, let's draw an apple. Or here's a piece of music, learn to play somebody else's music. Here's other people's writings, learn to understand that and remember that. But who is nurturing them and having them realize that they have things that they can have to offer? What skills are we teaching them to recognize that and to consider them as being good gifts, right? So we're, in a way, we're stripping them of that and filling them with all this stuff to ensure that they become good capitalistic soldiers and contrib contribute to an economy and vote, right? And so where does that lead, right? To me, it leads to turmoil. That's what all I see around me. I turn on the news, it's always bad news. I listen to music, it's about working through angst and frustration. And sometimes, you know, of course, if it's just beautiful music without words, 
you can capture, you know, you, you can feel it in a, in a different way. But for the most part, we're just regurgitating negativity. And we have to, it doesn't just happen to stop that. You have to work at it. You have to just say, I'm not going to do that, right? Like I, I decided I'm not going to listen to the radio anymore. It's just too negative. I won't. I'm not doing social media. It's just too negative. It gets negative. It gets horrible stuff comes on your feed. So I, I, I trusted it out. You know, I checked it out for like six months. I went, oh, no, I'm not getting into this. Got rid of it. Tried Twitter. Tried that for less. No, no, no. I'm not doing that. That's just leaving me. It's wasting my time. I got better things to do. So I'll check it out because I'm not going to make an ignorant decision. I've got to check it out and see what's going on. But I can see that we're always becoming distracted and away from what our individual entity is here to do at, in another way, in another um, more elemental way, a more sentient way, a more spirit way. And what do we have to help uh, better this and nurture all these beautiful things. I mean, you look at a tree, it's just, they're so magnificent. You look at a cloud moving, it's magnificent. And it's powerful, a thunderstorm, a rainstorm. And that stuff, uh, we're usually frightened by it. <laughs> it's like, get out of it quick, get out, it's gonna hurt you, right? And so we just don't do enough to honor these beautiful natural occurrences that take place and recognize that it's uh, not only its beauty but it feeds us it feeds our spirit and uh, i think we would do well to take the time to be more thoughtful around all that and that's what i'm doing that's why i do this work this is why uh, it's i call it spirit work it's because i'm consciously making an effort to thank the earth, to honor the earth, and to give the earth back to it, and have its last say. And not say, I need it to be red, so I'm gonna paint a red glaze on it, and that's how it has to be. I'm saying, here, now it's your turn. You have the final say on it, and whatever you decide is what it is. So I'm becoming a part of the process, or trying to become a part of that, that process, right? And I'm not trying to, um, control it, you know, and say it has to be like that and I'll be disappointed if it's not. So it's just a slightly different perspective off the main kind of uh, thoroughfare, right? But I gotta tell you, I am like never disappointed. <laughs> I'm a pretty happy camper and, and I really enjoy life and I really enjoy helping others and sharing and giving and being really generous, as generous as I can be with everyone. Because generosity is um, of time. My mom always taught me the biggest gift you can give anybody is your time. That's a gift. Uh, listening to people is a gift that you're giving them. You're giving them your time and your concern. And so, when you start to live like that, the universe takes care of you. We talked about that a little earlier. And it's just, when I need something, it comes to me. Like uh, yesterday when I was at that language meeting, um, we had done all this work. We had called together other language speakers in our area. We wanted to meet them. We wanted to let them know what we were doing. We were being very thoughtful and caring about them and inclusive about making sure they understood. We wanted to use language in the university, Emily Carter University, and we fed them and that's what you do. You always feed people, comfort them and have a conversation. And as soon as we finished all that work, a guy out of nowhere walked in there with this huge hide as a gift. And both Brent and I looked at each other, and I think Connie was there too, and we all went, <gasps> and it, to us, it was like the ancestors thanking us. They, they knew, because we believe our ancestors sit with us. We can't see them, but they like to come around, and they sit with you. And in a way, it was like they were there. It was, they, right away, there was thanks that was given. For, and, and we're going to use that, the students will use it. So you see what I mean about this reciprocal, you know, if you walk in a good way, things can't touch you, right? Because 
there's it goes through you and it doesn't stay with you and so uh, you're less apt to be uh, sad and lonely and unhappy right you just appreciate those kinds of moments so that's what I mean about how it comes back to you sometimes the turnarounds really quick like that we had just finished the meeting and he walked in with this big box we thought who is that guy what's he got there and he he explained it was um, it was his father's, his father passed away, he didn't know what to do with it. He did work at Emily Carr as a, I think, you know, in an industrial way. He wasn't a teacher or admin that way. He'd come in and, I think, help with the sort of running of the building. And, and then he just said, I, I thought of you, and I thought it would belong here, and I think my dad would really like it. <laughs> it's like we were thrilled, right, that, that this occurred. So anyway, that's magic, you see? That's, it's the unexpected and it's just this super fun. So we felt really good. We thought, yeah, it's all working in a good way. Thank you. So that's what I'm talking about, that kind of stuff. And to me, that's what faith is. That's perfect faith. It's just, well, you know, whatever's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And usually it's good stuff, you know, that comes about it. So. You know, even the way you and I got to, together, like, I'm always stunned at how stuff happens, right? And here we are. I don't, I've never met you before, and we're here, and we're, um, you know, talking up at the lake and seeing this territory, which you've never seen before, which is very lovely, and uh, just having a great time getting to know each other, quite un unexpectedly, but super fun, right? So it's good. It's all very good. Life is good. But anyway, so I... We can, I can show you burnishing, which is like, so after I finish the piece, what I do is I take, uh, this one has a slip on it, but it has to become the leather hearts at the leather hard stage. And then I just take a smooth stone. Maybe you can pass me that stone. See, it's right there on the shelf in that little bowl down next down, down there. Yeah. Yeah. Both of them. You can bring both of them. And then, um, so what I'll do is I'll take uh, these, I've had this stone here, which is a, a flint, it's a kind of a flint stone, and it's jasper, I think. Uh, both of them are jasper, but it's a red jasper and kind of an amber jasper. And I've had this since I was about 17, and I'm 66 now, so it's, I've had it a long time packing around and it's burnished an awful lot of pots. So it's burnished just about every pot I've ever made. And I'm up to, this is number, all my pots are numbered, so this is number 640. <laughs> so it's burnished a lot of pots. And it's never changed. You can see it's not become dull or anything. And so I take it at the leather heart stage and then I just take it and gently rub the surface of it and this motion causes the clay particles which are little rectangular shapes to lie flush to one another and that's what causes the light to reflect off the surface and once I've done it I'll go around the whole thing once set it aside let it dry a little bit more burnish again and uh, I might only have to do it a couple of times because I work very evenly, it dries evenly. So if you, if you go too far beyond, it'll start to scratch it because it gets too dry. And then I just set it aside and let it uh, totally dry. And that's when it goes into the electric kiln. And it goes uh, just for, I think, five or six hours. It's very low temperature. Uh, because if it goes much higher, the shine burns away. But if you uh, keep it at a lower firing temperature range, this the, the, the shininess is there. Then I take it out to the kiln outside, the just square, simple brick box, and I um, fill it with sawdust, combination of hardwood and softwood, and uh, textures, some powdery and curly Q stuff, and then pack sawdust around it and light the top. And then it slowly burns down. If it's a big fire in like say six pieces, it might take two to four days. Generally, it's about two days. And there's no sawdust left at all, and then that's when you get this um, this black, you know, like you saw in the other pieces, you get this black carbon, 
that is being released from the smoldering sawdust. And you can see it very, sometimes it's gray, sometimes it's, this is a nice even fire because I had it in a sager or an enclosed uh, tin to keep, um, to keep it just smoldering. You don't want flame because the flame burns the carbon away. And then what happens is that you can see the color of the clay body, which is okay. But if you're looking for black, you need to put it into and sagger it, like into a tin can of some sort. So you can see how the patina, you can see really see the patina and the shine from this one. So that's what the sawdust firing looks like in the end, in the end result of it. And then it's done. Then you sit with it for a while and you kind of see, the, sometimes you see various images on the surface and sometimes they'll tell you stories. <laughs> so that's my life, working with clay, pretty much. There's, uh, there's not much more to it other than just looking and admiring, you know, ancient potteries and seeing their form and shape and things that they were making. The great thing about clay is it's, even if it breaks, it always remains. There's always shards and stuff like that. It's pretty hard. It doesn't go, it doesn't go away. It doesn't like disintegrate very easily once you've got it uh, vitrified, once it's reached its vitrification point. These burnished pieces don't vitrify. They don't reach their, because I use a high fire clay body because it's smooth in a low fire temperature range. So uh, they're very porous. You wouldn't want to put water in here. It wouldn't break down again, because you can hear it's solid. But what would happen is it would start to leak out and it would dull the surface and it would get a sort of a salt. You know, it kind of takes the salt out of the water or whatever's in it the minerals and salts, and then it's, it'll start to gray it up. So you wouldn't, you could put grains in it, you could store different things like that in it, but just not anything with water or wet dirt. Yeah, otherwise it'll start to create uh, a different surface on it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. Got any questions? Well, you answered all my questions while narrating your work okay. on the side of practice, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was interested in, in your family history. Uh, oh I mean, more, I mean, more than maybe. <coughs> yeah, what we were talking about, I mean, your community work or the, your relationship with your nation or, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't know if that, I mean, we have a lot of material, but I. I'm just interested to know more. There is a lot of things there. Yeah, there are. I because I, you know, I do a lot of stuff. Obviously, like I have a lot of interests. I'm very community oriented, and I really like to be as helpful as I possibly can, especially with the knowledge that the elders have given me, and. Um, I have worked for the nation in various capacities. One of the most recent things that I've done is uh, worked as an ethnobotanical surveyor. And that feeds right into my work because, you know, I'm looking at plants. I love plants. They inspire my work. Um, I get to go way out into the bush, uh, high elevations and through all kinds of rain, sleet. You know, I've been out in torrential rains sometimes. and. So it's always very challenging, but it's always very exhilarating. And uh, I work with the archeologists and I was uh, documenting the various locations for plants and things like that so that we could use it as a reference for people. So somebody might go into the tribal office and say, you know, I really need some uh, which is uh, devil's club because uh, they use it as some of their medicine in the longhouses. Uh, can you tell us where I might find some? And so, of course, we just have to open it up into the computer and look for it, and then I would have all the GPS points of where I have found it in the locations that I've been going here and there throughout the mountain, mountainous area here. And um, so I, I've done that. Uh, you know, I... I think that, you know, being, I think I was talking to you at one point about that my work isn't, I'm not an Indian per se artist, like an indigenous artist. 
I am a person who is a potter, first and foremost, and my ethnicity is secondary to what I do. And, uh, but of course, and I grew up in uh, the city of Burnaby. I didn't grow up on the reserve. I didn't grow up with my language, my father's language or my mother's language. I never heard it until I was, you know, in my 40s. I, I did study Northwest Coast Design and Carving. I did learn a bit of language there on my mom's side, Kwakiwak with the Hunt family, because Tony was a fluent speaker and so was his great uncle Tommy. And I spent a lot of time with them, listening to them speak in their ancestral language, Kwakiwak, well, in my mom's language. And then, uh, so it's all been a big learning curve, you know, um, but at the heart of it, I have always been Indigenous, right? I have always been, I was born into that. You know, it's only been a few generations that we haven't lived off the land and lived in a, in a communal way. So I think that's still very much a part of me and that's why I'm part, that's why I'm so community oriented because that's my genetic makeup and it hasn't been bred out of me or it, it's only been a few generations since I've, our, our family lineage has lived that way. And so, and my interests have always been about the earth, right? And uh, understanding the plants, the medicines, learning the language. And like I said, I didn't, I didn't grow up with any of that. It wasn't popular to be First Nations when my mom and dad were growing up. They were really ridiculed. They were, the, uh, native, the non-native people would, you know, hurl you know, things like Dirty Indian at them, at my mom sometimes. She'd go to the reservation to visit family. They didn't like her because she lived off reserve. So, you know, she, she got it from both sides. And it wasn't popular for people to admit that they were Indigenous. Now we can say this is who we are and we can celebrate our languages and our cultures and uh, cultural um, participation in longhouses and our ceremonial things without fear of being um, it having it taken away from us or us being put in jail for it or or uh, into residential schools so so we're getting more and more freedom and we're getting stronger and feeling better about expressing those things but just because I didn't live on the reserve and just because I didn't live in those in that way or I still am an extremely culturally minded person and my mom, you know, she would take us out into the yard and say, see that, that's uh, plantain, or we call it this, um, uh, or that, you can eat that. See that berry, you can eat that berry. So she really taught us a lot about what we could and couldn't eat out in, out in nature. Uh, my dad was an avid fisherman, so we always fished. And so we learned a lot about the cycles of salmon, a lot of, about... Uh, how to can it. We'd go on the banks of the Fraser River and we'd can it there. We'd go fish it, net fish it, uh, bring it in, can it. And, you know, so we lived really how we always lived and how our families have always lived. It just happened that we lived in a city called Burnaby. So I've never thought that I wasn't living in a cultural way. And we did a lot of stuff communally. Like my mom grew up in a family of six children. So all those children, you know, grew up, had children, four and five of their own. We'd get together like all the time in Stanley Park and we'd have picnics and we were always together. We celebrated Christmases and Easter's and all the occasions, the entire family was together. So it was hugely communal. Uh, one of the family members would bake the bread, another one would bring the dessert, another one would bring the turkey. You know, so we all donated and still lived very communally. So I don't think that just because I grew up and went to public school or went on to college, I don't think I've not lived in a cultural way. And um, certainly, you know, coming back here uh, and even making the decision that I was going to go work in the band office rather than continue on with my practice, and I did to some degree, but to make that my priority, to learn the language and to develop the language to help preserve the language, you know, was, uh, it was, I did it to respect my father and his ancestors. I did it because I am on the land that they honored. And so I have a responsibility to that. 
And I'm also the firstborn of this generation. I'm the eldest of this generation. There's about, I think my grandmother had about 90, 90 to close to 100 people that were born after me, uh, my cousins and second cousins and things. And so I am the keeper of knowledge. I'm the one that has learned the stories. And if anybody ever wants to know anything, they can come to me. I don't force it upon them, but they know that. Um, some of my nieces and nephews will come to me if they're doing school school projects. I've always been the one to be the caretaker of that. And I started that when I was very young, not knowing that that was a thing that we actually did. It, I wasn't told that, I just naturally did that. And so um, that's part of my responsibility, right? Learning the language was part of my responsibility. And I, I, gained so much by sitting with these incredibly beautiful women and hearing their stories. And one of, the, one of um, my mentors, Satsukot, she, she took in 40 children and looked after 40 children and raised them that were foster children. Like, who does that, right? And, and um, the, everyone was poor then. You know, we had food, we had fish, we, had, we knew how to hunt and gather and things like that. But, you know, it, uh, it still took a lot to feed all those kids over a period, over a lifetime. And she had children of her own, but she would never turn away a child. She would always look after, after children that needed help or wanted to be there with her. So I don't, yeah, I don't see myself as uh, not living a cultural life, even though I didn't grow up in the, what they think of as a cultural life. We still have the same principles and values that we were taught by our parents and our grandparents, same kind of thing. And my, my grandfather, one of my grandfathers, uh, my mom's dad, that guy, he could, we would go on a holiday and he would find us. He could find us in San Diego. We'd go down to San Diego and we'd travel to visit relatives down there. And we would leave and they'd get lonely for us, my grandmother and grandfather. And the next thing you know, because we traveled in a trailer and a little station wagon and you know, they would find us in San Diego without knowing where we were. So he was really intuitive. Like he could just figure out who could do that. Who could just magically find without any, no postcards, nothing. He would just go, I think this is where they are. And they'd show up. It's like, how did you do that? You know, and he would teach me things, how to whistle in certain ways or um, understand, you know, fish or he was a great fisherman. So I, I am, super thankful like that I had the ability to walk the land and to be out here in my grandfather's land which was like 60 to 80 acres and a lot of it was bush and they would just turn us loose and we would go run way back in the bush like far away right like across the fields and uh, my job was to look for well I was the egg collector I was the one who would have to climb up way up in the uh, lofts to all the the chickens would roost in a very narrow area and I'd crawl up there because it was very tiny and I would just shimmy my way across there and I would reach under. My grandfather taught me how to sing to the chickens so that they wouldn't peck me and to calm them. I had to really calm myself and I'd hum or just be really uh, slow and then I'd have to steal. If they had three, I had to get my hand underneath and if they had three eggs, I could take two. I always had to leave one to encourage them, right, to have more. And one time I was up there, I never felt that it was a long way, but there was hay, I would have landed on hay. Um, there was a fox up there one time, I don't know how he got up there, and I crawled all the way along and I stopped, I sensed that there was something watching me and I looked around, and then all of a sudden, way in the corner, underneath the eave, I saw these two bright, like sparkly, beady eyes, and I was like, what the heck is that? And he, he wouldn't move, and I moved a little closer to see, and it, it startled him a bit to move. And he came out, and it was a big red-tailed red fox. And he just crawled all the way across the beam. He kept looking at me and looking at me, and he finally took a dive into the hay, hay and scurried away, right? So it, it was always, and no one watched me. No one went and said, here, you, you can't do that. And I was just little. Like, I was probably like seven years old, and I'd be climbing up there doing stuff like that. So we were always given the freedom to explore um, without any kind of supervision. 
but we were taught how to be in that situation, right? And should anything happen, one had to come home. So we had, there was always a plan around it or a guiding, you know, uh, around it. But it was never, oh, you can't do that. Now I feel bad for the kids. They can't, they get driven everywhere. You know, they, where do they go on their own? Not very far, right? They're very supervised. Now everybody's got phones. You can GPS them. You know, I know where my kid is. So it was not like that. We had complete freedom. And, and we learned how to explore. And we learned how to, uh, you know, not be afraid of sounds or things that we didn't maybe know what it was. And uh, being around big Clydesdale horses and other horses and also cows. You know, you, we just learned how to be able to walk up. My grandfather taught us how to approach them and how to be around them, never stand behind them. And we milked, we helped milk the cows. My favorite thing of anything was, there was always a lot of wildcats around here. And they were here to, you know, encouraged to be here to look after the mice, keep the mice population down. But they'd come when we were milking the cows and we'd sp spray them with milk. And they'd sit there, all these little kittens, you know, maybe five, ten of them would all line up. And they'd just sit there, they'd open their mouths and we'd just squirt milk at them. And they would be covered in milk and they were so happy. They'd all lick each other and they'd all drink the milk, you know, that was being squirted at them. And they'd sit there and then they'd just clean themselves, clean themselves, and then they'd all take off. And it was such a beautiful thing to watch, right? And they were always really happy over the milk, so. But yeah, so we had a great upbringing. Right. And uh, I'm so very thankful for that. I don't think many kids have that freedom anymore. That's what freedom is, right? Being able to explore without any kind of restriction on you. And I think that develops really strong, uh, strong, well-balanced people, you know, because they, they have, they have uh, the ability of trust trust in themselves to know what what they can do or they can't do. So being here has been good. Um, and learning the language, learning more about the culture, understanding uh, the deeper aspects of the culture, longhouse culture. Uh, people have told me the most extraordinary things, um, which I would never talk about. But they're, uh, it's really, really good to know that what, what is going on here, and I, I don't know if I've said this to you, but uh, I'll say it again because it's really important. The people of the Longhouse in the big houses and longhouses uh, in British Columbia, or any other ceremonial things that are going on, whether in the, the Acomor Pueblo watching you know, Kachina dancers or watching the people here dance, they are dancing for everyone. They are dancing for the spirits of the earth. They are doing healing work for the earth. They are honoring the elements. They are doing really, really important work. And they dedicate their lives to that. And they're uh, in the winter during the ceremonials, there might be 500 to 1,000 people in these longhouses, and they're all doing that work for everybody, not just for Indians or indigenous or whatever you want to call us. It's like it's for the betterment of everyone. And I really wish people would understand that. This isn't an isolated act. For just them. It's for everyone and for the well-being of the earth and of spirit. And that's so important, right? Uh, it's important work. And it's not like praying and it's not like that. It's actually physical dancing, you know, and they fast, they take care of their body, they make sure that they're healthy, and it's very rigorous. So it's not just a mind thing, you know, where oh, I can go to church once a week and I can say thanks to God, right, for everything I've got and then I can go about my business. It's not like that. It's like this is a practice, right, a, three, a physical practice of well-being that they're doing. 
So I am so incredibly grateful for that. And I think that people should know that's what's going on. It's not just isolated instances and it's, oh, ooh, I don't understand it. It must be scary and it must be weird, right? But it's not that at all. And it's very private, yes, but, but uh, it's also contributing to the greater good. And I'm really thankful for that. So that is uh, super, super important work. And we need to honor that. So hopefully, you know, people people will come to understand that eventually, and they won't, you know, kind of. There's a lot of racism up here. I never experienced racism until I moved here. Oh man, I've seen some stuff and had stuff done to me. And oddly enough, people think I'm East Indian. They don't. Even, they and they tell me go home, and I go go home. It's like, yeah, go back to India. And I like, but I'm I'm not. I don't, I'm not that kind of Indian, right? And so it's like, they don't, they don't even know. They're like, considering I'm a whole other ethnicity, I think it's funny. But um, yeah, I've had some interesting altercations with people that have come up and tried to intimidate me and things, and I've just stood my ground. Basically, I just stand and listen, right? And I don't say anything. I let them vent, and then I'll walk away, and they hate that, I think, even more than a fight, right? But yeah, a lot of racism here. So I've seen that firsthand and understood what it's like to witness being a marginalized person. Because before that, I was just a kid, right, with a bunch of other kids. It wasn't about that you're an Italian, you're an Indian, you're a Scot, you're a this or that, a German. It's just like you're just a kid. And so it was a very different kind of upbringing. But it's not like that here. And uh, so you have to learn to kind of uh, manage these kinds of incidences, right? And not let them get under your skin, but it's a pretty interesting learning curve there. I would have never expected that. Yeah, so compassion. Compassion is hugely, hugely important. And it's things that people don't, that we have, you know, street people, and I look at street people as the hunters and gatherers of this time and place. And I, I really honor and value what they're doing. They're out there gathering up tin cans and they're doing uh, all this really important work. And I think, wow, thank you, you guys. Or there's one fellow here that sits on the street all the time. And I think that people just look at people like that and go, oh, you know, they've got problems. But when I look at him, I go, one day I went to him and I thanked him I took, I made him some soup and he didn't want it, but I said to him, you know, I have to thank you because you teach me compassion. Every time I drive by, I think my heart opens up and so you're giving me um, the feeling of compassion and I have to thank you for that because that's a gift, right? But, so I look at it differently. It's not like, look at that guy, right? Or I'm afraid of that guy. It's like, no. He's giving me a gift by making my heart open up for him. And that's a good thing, right? Compassion is good. And where else are you going to get compassion? So, so it's very important to be open-minded about these things and not just to be, you know, like narrow-minded and go, oh, I don't want to look, right? Or that kind of stuff. So I really appreciate uh, people who do that and who, I don't look at it like, oh, they're downtrodden, and, oh, they have nothing to give, or oh, they're just lazy. No, they're out there working and surviving. It's different than what normal, you know, normally people are forced into doing, but they're still contributing, and they're still helping. And so it's not fair for us to look at people like that and go, oh, gee, you know, you're worthless, because they're not. They're doing work that other people won't do, right? <laughs> And, and, and they're doing it in a very humble way, in a very good way. So I really wish people would focus on that kind of uh, attitude towards people and homeless people. Not always, oh, they're drugged, oh, it's mental illness, right? Well, it, sometimes it's that. Other times it's people who are just choosing a different way. And sometimes they're there because they don't have a choice, right? Yeah, have to keep more open-minded about things. I'm extremely thankful. I'm thankful for 
my place and where I am and my ancestors who are giving it to me. I work hard too, but it's, uh, you know, they went before me and they set the groundwork in order to be here, so it's a good thing. <laughs>